David Edward and Fran Hawthorne discuss Fran's book, I Meant to Tell You. Fran, how are you? Oh, I'm great. How are you, Dave? I'm doing really good. You know, we, we were talking for a little bit, and I thought maybe that you had your first book coming out, but it turns out that it might even be your second or third book, or it might be your 12th book, and you <laughs> might have actually started submitting books when you were like 10 years old. What, 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 what's going on? Yeah, I just, you know, an addict, a lifelong addict. Um, I started, okay, a lot of people write, you know, stories, quote, you know, book stories when they're little kids. And I was serious, okay? Um, I submitted my first, no, I submitted a novel for the first time when I was a tween, you know, a young teen. I sent it off to, you know, what we would now call, I guess, self-publishing, and then it was called a vanity press. And uh, they sent back a letter saying, you know, dear, um, please contact us again when you're old enough to sign a contract. <laughs> so um, I guess that's a rejection letter or is that an encouragement? Anyway, um, and that really? was not my first novel. That was wow. not even my first completed novel. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, but 10 years old to package that up and send it off that, that, you know, many adults today couldn't get all the way to the end of that, that path. So that's amazing. Oh, thank you. Or it's, I don't know, stupid, um, <laughs> naive, idealistic. Anyway. Um, yeah, I kind of, I kind of like that young me. And there's actually one novel I wrote in middle school that wasn't bad, pretty advanced about families switching their kids at birth. That's very Freudian, obviously, too for a kid to write. Um, and I, I wish I could find it, but you know. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, it's the, the, the old days with paper, right? Yeah. Now it's all computer. All yeah. right, so, so you've written, I meant to tell you, which comes out in November. So we're talking about it a little early, but it, but it's available as a pre-order um, right now. So, so and this is your, this is a, a, a fictional book. So it's a right. story, but this, and this is your second published fictional book. Right, my second published novel, and then I've written um, eight nonfiction books before that that got published. <laughs> Some of yeah. which I, as we talked earlier, I, I think are wildly interesting because they capture important topics. But I think your first one that I saw came out fourteen or fifteen years ago, um, so it's it's interesting to see you, you were on to a lot of stuff that's going on a, a lot earlier than the rest of us. That's for sure. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, my first published nonfiction book was about the drug company Merck and the whole pharma industry. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's a will always be a hot topic, right? I mean, I was in, investigating the quote gifts that are given to doctors in order to prescribe, and and um, you know, and, and the next book was more about the pressure on the Food and Drug Administration. But I suppose I'm being a terrible um, uh, person to talk about myself because I shouldn't get sidetracked. <laughs> but it's well, okay. but you, yeah. you have a lot, you have a lot of um, agency when it comes to the stories that you're telling. So, so what is, I meant to tell you, what is that book about? It is about it, how a woman who gets arrested for helping her friend kidnap her own daughter uh, <laughs> seven years later, when her fiance discovers this arrest, it jeopardizes their marriage and starts leading to an unraveling of secrets in all three families going back generations underpinning all this there's another theme that's very important to me and that theme is whether we have a responsibility to take action to make the world a better place because this is something that's important to the protagonist Miranda her fiance and her family which is also part of the family secrets Interesting. Oh, I know. I'm, it's terrible. It's more than an elevator pitch, isn't it? It's <laughs> multiple words. Well, I think I think it sounds wildly interesting. I, I think I think it's a, a good story, and it's it's a timely story on some level, but it's eternal. It's a timeless story, I suppose. Um, also, so as as your second book, um, can you talk a little bit about about the process you went through to write it? You know, did you write on a word count? Did you outline it? And how did it compare? Now, I know you've been writing fiction forever, but but how has your writing <laughs> process evolved as yeah. you've gotten? I don't want to say better at it, but as you've done it longer, it was supposed to say that. I hope I've gotten better. I don't um, know. I, I don't remember my process when I was 10 years old. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, except I did print very carefully on lined paper. Um, but uh, now I use a laptop. Uh, but um, I outline. Oh my God. I, I would be lost without an outline. You know, I, there, there are novelists who don't use outlines. I don't know. 
Having said that, my final book is about 40% true to the original outline, you know, um, and that's wonderful because the characters move on their own. They say things, they do things that I didn't expect. And also plot lines that I thought would make sense don't. Um, I mean, I go through, oh, I don't even count the number of revisions. Um, and I show to other people and I go to workshops, but even without those, my own, you know, in my head revisions. Um, I once tried the word count per day um, at one point in, in the third novel that I'm working on. I did, the, the, you have to write a thousand words a day. And actually that really worked for me. I really kept at it and I felt really good. And it forced me to work later into the night than I would have. Ah, that only works on first drafts, however. And it was obviously with the revision, you might be far better off if your net at the end of the day is negative 200 words, you know? Yeah. Um, so, but I, now again, everybody has to have, you know, her or his own you know, writing process. Um, so I find it again, working for me. Um, you Right now I'm revising book number three so that that word count gig probably won't write, although there's some revisions that are entire new chapters and I could try that again. Look, I, I write on the word count. Um, and, um, it, it, once I started doing that to myself and I, and I have a different word. So weekdays when I've got a job, I have my word count is less than the weekends when I, when I know I have more time, but for me, just like you, it, it, it works. It, it really works. And I have these little micro senses of accomplishment. You know, if, I, if my word count goes like, like you said, like a thousand words and I write 3000, cause I'm having a good day or into it. I'm like, yeah, you know, I feel good. Like, like I've done something. So can I ask how many words on, let's say. On your work day and on your weekend, how many words do you set for yourself as a goal? So, so work day, I get up early and then I do 1,200 words. And on the weekends, I do 3,000 a day. Whoa, I'm impressed. But oh. I don't outline. <laughs> so I, I well, that, that's not true. For the, I write about half fiction and half history books. So for the history books, I, I it has to be an outline. I, I live off of an outline. For the fiction books, I, I know, I call them the tent posts or the milestones. I know what the milestones, and I know the ending. I know where I character where I want the characters to be at the end. And of course, I know the resolution to the mess that I've set up. And then I let them, I let them take me there. And I've tried outline. I'm curious about outline. You mentioned that it, what your your last book was is about forty percent of your outline. How do you know when to trust? your prior self that wrote the outline or when to trust your current self who's hip deep in the story and is trying to, you know, fight their way through the swamp. Oh, you have to trust the current self who knows the story, who was in the story. The first self had a vision and, and I, my outlines are incredibly detailed. I mean, I, if I think of some dialogue I want in each chat in a chapter, I will put that in, you know, some chapters are, are more brief, you know, the outline, it depends. Um, and, um, but that really is just a guide for me. Uh, to keep me on track for one thing, because to get from point A to point B, you really have to go around C and get around the curve of D and X and Y, you know, so I can't forget those intermediate steps. I got my alphabet totally messed up, didn't I? Um, anyway. Oh, I just um, thought you were a creative genius. So I just went you. with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, so, no, but once I get going and I, as I said, I see that what I thought would work doesn't work or I, a character tells me a brilliant inspiration yeah. um you've got to go with that and then when i'm revising i may throw out that inspiration too and have some other reason um so uh, now do, do you go back and update your outline as you're writing sometimes sometimes yeah we uh, try to think i suppose well i would yeah actually i should say all the time that that's a, that's a good question um i'll certainly update the future outline the chapters I haven't gotten to yet and i update the past i update the past outline to help me in my revisions yeah. because i do when i'm revising and i want to go back i remember there was a scene and what chapter was it in i need my outline to be accurate to help me find that scene faster because there's i mean when you write nonfiction, so it, it may be less of a problem, but you know, if, if I painted a character with blonde hair, did I put, does she have blonde hair or doesn't she, you know, right. I better be accurate. I better be consistent. You know? Unless she dyes her hair, you know, then on purpose, you know, well, then you just got to mention it in a throwaway line somewhere. Right. If, if the chair color, yeah. Cause, cause well, readers... there's the other thing. Oh, speak about throwaway lines. Although this is less a function of outlining, you know, but if there's an insight, a line, a dialogue, that I 
I want to use. And I, did I use it before? <laughs> Thank yeah. goodness. Thank goodness for laptops, right? And search, and you can find it. I mean, um, in my 10 year old days, I don't know how I would have gone back <laughs> and found it. Um, and I may not have, you know. Um, well, it was a lot. Yeah. You know, I, I, it, it's funny you bring that up because as a writer, I, I find two things happen. One is I'll get, I'll fall in love with a word for like a page and a half. So, you know, every, everything was spacious or, you know, just, just what everything was purple. Um, that, and then I'll have, just like you said, I have a clever line I want to use. And then when I go back and reread it, I use it like nine times because I just, you know, each time I thought it, this is a clever point. And then I, I, I didn't forget that I used it before, but it's just not the way writing works. You know, you're in the moment and you, and you think you're making a point and you go back and look, it's like, no, no. Cause for a while I was saying yet here we are that like, that was my big oh. close, all these arguments, like, like every character say it every time, I'm like, no, that's no good. Find the one that works and get rid of the other ones. Oh yeah. Um, I'm a fiend about repetition, avoiding repetition. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm using oh, clean, the word clean, you know, there's a reason. It's a good, solid word. It describes something. Um, I will not use it twice on the same page. That is a given. Right. I try not to use it twice within, I don't know, a few pages. Right. Maybe more, more, more than six times in the book, if I can help. It depends on the word. And I will ransack my mind. And um, I, I, was, I saw a Twitter feed once when um, one writer asked, do you ever use a thesaurus? And I cringed and I answered honestly, it was embarrassment, maybe two times per book, but there are times when my mind absolutely goes blank. Now, the good question is, is it ever in use? <laughs> Does it ever come up with words you didn't think of that, that are relevant, you know? And yeah. yeah. I think at the two times per book, I might use it once. It might be useful, you know, yeah. uh, but I confess, you know, um, yeah, look, you have to, I, I, I would never, yeah. Shift F7 is the, the source <laughs> and word. And there are times I'm just like, okay, okay. You know, the, the, the air was clean and then he, you know, it's like, no, I want to need another word. Oh, atmosphere or, or a boat, boat, boat. How about vessel? Oh yeah. Vessel that, you know, just, yeah, but the vessel is highfalutin, you know, so you have to, yeah. yeah. You know, you gotta and, use it right. and then sometimes, um, I really think about it. Well, the reason I am using stood too often is because my characters are always standing up. <laughs> no, wait a second. That's also annoying. That's a little tick. Right. You know, right. Um, as one editor advised me, you have too many, you know, these ticks, man. Um, so, you know, I do hope I've become, as time goes on, I've become more sensitive to ticks. Not so much repetition. I was always really sensitive to that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you. I, even if I'm not specifically reading my book out loud, I hear it. And it's like music. Where I'm, you know, words, lyrics and music. I hear it. And awkward phrasing physically hurts me. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, and repetition is part of that, you know. Um, but somehow ticks are less obvious to me than, ref than plain old repetition. So yeah. I have to really be well, vigilant and, about that. And ticks are okay if it becomes a quirk of, of a singular character as opposed to a quirk of as you, the author, right? So if you got yes. one character that's always sitting down and getting up, okay, well, that's, that's interesting. If every character is always sitting down and getting up, that is monotonous or whatever. Or, or an unusual quirk. Like in my new novel, I meant to tell you, the protagonist, well, I hope, I don't know if people will notice this or not. The protagonist is always fiddling with her hair. Okay. Sometimes she's pulling it back in a scrunchie. Sometimes she's twirling it. You know, and and so the fiddlings can change. So that's one part of variety. But the fact that she fiddles, that's her nervous tick, you know? Uh, so, and I think that's great. I'm praising myself. But it's great when any novelist does that. Yeah, that's one way. It goes back, you know, to the Iliad and the Odyssey, Wiley Odysseus, that adjective was always attached to his name. That was his personality quirk to help the bards, you know, who were reciting it out loud and the listeners who didn't have books in front of them to remember. So I think that if you're going to give um, a quirk, but again, don't overuse it. Um, yeah. You know, again, I mean, Miranda fiddles with her hair maybe seven times in the book I, you know someone else will read it please and count it and then tell me i'm wrong but i tried even that not to make her feel too often you right know? right that's yeah. interesting so yeah. did anything in your writing process has anything in your writing process changed over the years 
um, as I said, not, I don't remember what I did when I was 10, with my two grown up novels. The process hasn't changed. I mean, I hope I've learned to be a better writer, you know, um, as I said, being more aware of, of ticks. Um, but just more, more self I outlined, I've always yeah. outlined, I've always let the characters run away and do what they want to do, come back later. I revise and revise and revise. Um, I show it to workshops. I have hired, you know, outside editors to help me. So all of that, I would say is, is oh, and I research. That's the other thing. You know, I, I spent my lifetime as a journalist and then a nonfiction author. So I simply cannot write a novel with false falsehoods, with tiny exceptions. I mean, um, there's, um, uh, well, the novel that I'm working on now, um, the characters go see a showing of Annie in Los Angeles in, I think, 2003. Well, actually, Annie went to the West Coast to San Francisco first, and it would not have been in Los Angeles when they saw it. And that, you can tell, that still bothers me. <laughs> I will let myself do that in my novels. But in other words, I did the kind of research to find out when did Annie go on the road and, you know. Um, or I'll give you another example, maybe uh, more relevant to this book. Um, you know, uh, there's a scene set in Ellis Island today, you know, modern day, um, but envisioning the ancestors. Anyway, so I, I live in New York, so it was easy. I went out to Ellis Island, um, but I was copiously taking notes, not looking up my ancestors. I'd already done that. But on what do the walls look like? What do the benches look like? You know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, it was going to be accurate. Yeah. You know, um, and I'm probably the only person who has ever visited Ellis Island to research the bench. <laughs> yeah, you know? yes, that's so. So research. So, so what advice? So we, we need to wrap it up. Um, oh, so wow. if you had advice for someone now, maybe the maybe not maybe not the ten year old you because that's a little early. Uh, but you know, maybe the the eighteen year old you or, the, or <laughs> whenever you felt like you were you know a, a grown up writing a writer. Um, what, what advice would you either go back and give yourself or what advice for you have someone who thinks they have a story in them um, and they want to get started, uh, but they want to learn some of your wisdom? Oh, I don't know about my wisdom. But I would say one thing is, um, look, we all need to earn a living. We all need to survive. Um, you know, I got distracted by nonfiction and I had a great career and, and I loved it. Still, I would say I, I pushed fiction aside for too long. And I would say as much as you can, do it, find time, you know, and, and I know people are juggling three jobs and kids and it's, it's easy for me to sit here and say it, but that's a big regret is, is that I, I let myself come up with excuses to push it aside. And yeah. then the other piece of advice I would give is I don't care how brilliant you are, you need someone else to read your stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and. Tell everybody it's the first draft, even if it's your 10th draft, you know, if that helps you <laughs> to show. But honestly, get someone you trust, yeah. you know, who's an avid reader, who's a professional writer, whatever, who, yeah, who yeah. is in your genre, you know, obviously. Um, so I guess those are the two pieces of advice. I, I think I think those I think that's good advice. Um, and then the last piece I would add to that would just be pick a story you want to know the ending of. Right. Because because finishing it right is is. It, is is the hard part it's all hard it's all hard way harder than you think you think but finishing it so if you want to know just like your readers want to know then you pick the right story then you see a much better chance of finishing it so i think that's i think that's really solid advice that's well, a great piece of advice dave thank you <laughs> well, it came from you um all right so fran your book comes out november 3rd 15th november 15th but you can pre-order it right now i'll put a link to it below thank um you. and uh, hopefully it's a big splash and uh yeah. Hopefully there's nothing that you didn't mean to tell me that you forgot to. I tried to work the title in, but it didn't really Thank work. <laughs> I meant to tell you. Um, and uh, when your next book comes out, let me know. and We'll chat about it again. Thank you so much. Even good luck in your writing. Thank you very much, Fran. Thank you. Bye. Uh, bye. Thank you for watching. Please consider hitting the subscribe button.